how much of the malleability is hardware, how much is software? Is that useful at all in the brain? So like, what, what are we talking about? So there's like, there's neurons, there's uh, uh, synapses, and the all kinds of different synapses, and there's chemical communication, like electrical signals, and there's chemical communication from the, in the synapses. Uh, what I would say, the software would be the timing and the nature of the electrical signals, I guess, and the hardware would be the actual synapses. So here's the thing. This is why I really, if we can, I want to get away from the hardware and software mm -hmm. metaphor because what happens is as activity passes through the system, it changes things. Now, the thing that uh, computer engineers are really used to thinking about is, is synapses where two neurons connect. Of course, each neuron connects with 10,000 of its neighbors, but at a point where they connect, um, what we're all used to thinking about is the changing of the strength of that connection, the, the synaptic weight. Um, but in fact, everything is changing. The receptor distribution inside that neuron so that you're more or less sensitive to the neurotransmitter. Then the structure of the neuron itself and, and what's happening there, all the way down to biochemical cascades inside the cell, all the way down to the nucleus. And for example, the epigenome, which is the um, you know, these little proteins that are attached to the DNA that cause conformational changes that cause more genes to be ex uh, expressed or, or repressed. All of these things are plastic. The reason that most people only talk about the synaptic weights is because that's really all we can measure well. And all this other stuff is really, really hard to see with our current technology. So essentially that just gets ignored. Mm -hmm. But, but in fact, the system is plastic at all these different levels. And, and my, my way of thinking about this is an analogy to pace layers. So pace layers is a concept that Stuart Brand um, suggested about how to think about cities. So you have fashion, which changes rapidly in cities. You have um, um, governance, which changes more slowly. You have the structure, the buildings of a city, which changes more slowly, all the way down to, to nature. You've got all these different layers of things that are changing at different paces, at different speeds. I've taken that idea and, and mapped it onto the brain, which is to say you have some biochemical cascades that are just changing really rapidly when something happens, mm -hmm. all the way down to things that are more and more cemented in there. And this is actually, uh, this actually allows us to understand a lot about particular kinds of things that happen. For example, one of the oldest, probably the oldest rule in neurology is called Ribot's Law, which is that older memories are more stable than newer memories. So when you get old and demented, you'll be able to remember things from your, your young life. Maybe you'll remember this podcast, but you won't remember what you did a month ago or a year ago. Mm -hmm. And this is a very weird structure, right? No other system works this way where older memories are more stable than, than newer memories. Um, but it's because through time, things get more and more cemented into deeper layers of the system. And, um, and so this is, I think, the way we have to think about the brain, not as, okay, you've got neurons, you've got synaptic weights, and that's it. So yeah, so the idea of live wear and live wired is that... Is that it's a, it's like a it's a gradual, yeah, it's a gradual spectrum between software and hardware, and so the metaphor is completely doesn't make sense because like when you talk about software and hardware, it's really hard lines. I mean, of course, software is uh, unlike hard, but even hardware, but like. So there's two groups, but in the software world, there's levels of abstractions, right? There's the, the operating system, there's machine code, and then it gets higher and higher levels. But somehow that's actually fundamentally different than the layers of abstractions in the hardware. But in the brain, it's all like the same. And I love the city, the city metaphor. I mean, yeah, it's kind of mind blowing because it it's hard to know what to uh, think about that. Like if I were to ask the question, uh, this is an important question for machine learning, is um, how does the brain learn? So essentially you're saying that, I mean, it just learns on all of these different levels at all different paces. Exactly right. And as a result, what happens is as you practice something, you get good at something, you're physically changing the circuitry. You're, you're, you're adapting your brain around the thing that is relevant to you. So let's say you take up, um, do you know how to surf? Nope. Okay, great. So let's say you take <laughs> up surfing. Yeah. Now at this age, 
Um, what happens is, you know, you'll be terrible at first. You don't know how to operate your body. You don't know how to read the waves, things like that. And through time, you get better and better. What you're doing is you're burning that into the actual circuitry of your brain. You're, of course, conscious when you're first doing it. You're thinking about, okay, where am I doing? What's my body weight? Um, but eventually, when you become a pro at it, you are not conscious of it at all. In fact, you can't even unpack what it is that you did. Think about riding a bicycle. You you can't describe how you're doing it. You're just doing it. You're changing your balance when you come, you know, you do this to go to a stop and so on. So um, this is what we're constantly doing is actually shaping our own circuitry based on what is relevant for us. Survival, of course, being the, the top thing that's relevant. But interestingly, uh, especially with humans, we have these particular goals in our lives, computer science, neuroscience, whatever. And so we actually shape our circuitry around that. I mean, you mentioned this gets slower and slower with age, but is there, like I've, I think I've uh, read and spoken offline, even on this podcast with a, a developmental neurobiologist, I guess would be the right terminology, is like looking at the very early, like from, from embryonic stem cells to like to, to, the, to the creation of the brain. And like, that's like, what, that's mind blowing how much stuff happens there. So it's very malleable at that stage. Uh, it's, and then, but after that, what, at which point does it stop being malleable? So, so, so that's the interesting thing is that it remains malleable your whole life. So even when you're an old person, you'll be able to remember new faces and names. You'll be able to learn new sorts of tasks. And thank goodness, because the world is changing rapidly in terms of technology and so on. I just sent my mother an Alexa and she, you know, figured out how to go in the settings and do the thing. And I was really, yeah, I was really impressed by that, that she was able to do it. So there are parts of the brain that remain malleable their whole life. The, the interesting part is that really your goal is to make an internal model of the world. Your goal is to say, okay, the brain uh, is trapped in silence and darkness and it's trying to understand how the world works out there, right? <laughs> I love that image. Yeah, I guess yeah. it is. Yeah. You forget. <laughs> you forget. It's like this this, <laughs> this lonely thing is sitting in its own container and uh, trying to actually, through a few sensors, figure out what the, what the hell's going on. You know what I sometimes think about is um, <laughs> the that, that movie, The Martian with Matt Damon, mm -hmm. the, um, I mean, it was originally a book, of course, but the, the, the movie poster shows Matt Damon all alone on the red planet. And I think, God, that's actually what it's like to be inside your head and my head and anybody's head is that you're essentially on your own planet in there. And I'm essentially on my own planet. Everyone's got their own world where you're, you've absorbed all of your experiences up to this moment in your life that have made you exactly who you are and same for me and everyone. And, um, and we've got this very thin bandwidth of communication and... I'll say something like, oh, yeah, that tastes just like peaches. And you'll say, oh, I know what you mean. But uh, the experience, of course, might be might be vastly different for us. Um, but anyway, yes. Yeah, so the brain is trapped in silence and darkness, each one of us. And what it's trying to do, this is the important part, it's trying to make an internal model of what's going on out there, as in how do I function in the world? How do I, how do I interact with other people? Do I say something nice and polite? Do I say something aggressive and mean? Do I, you know, all these things that it's putting together about the world. And I think what happens when people get older and older, it may not be that plasticity is diminishing. It may be that their internal model essentially has set itself up in a way where it says, okay, I've pretty much got a really good understanding of the world now, and I don't really need to change, mm -hmm. right? So when, old, when, when, when much older people find themselves in a situation where they need to change, they can they actually are able to do it. It's just that I think this notion that we all have that plasticity diminishes as we grow older is in part because the motivation isn't there. Um, but, but if you were 80 and you got fired from your job and suddenly had to figure out how to program a WordPress site or something, you'd figure it out. Got it. So the, the capability, the possibility of change is, is there. 